Uh, hello, Russ. How are you? Doing great. Good to see you, Glenn. And good to see you, too. This is Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show, blogheads.tv, coming to you from the Watson Institute for Public and International Affairs at Brown University, which is uh, one of my employers here. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, welcome Ross Levine, economist at the University of California, Berkeley's uh, Haas School of Business, and an expert on financial economics, an old friend of mine, former colleague from Brown. Uh, so welcome to the show, Ross. Good to be back. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to you, besides just that it's a delight to talk to you, is that, as you know, we're now here in the year 2019, uh, 10 years down the road from the, the onset of the Great Recession and of the huge financial uh, collapse of 2007-2009. Uh, you, uh, along with James Barth and uh, Gerard Caprio Jr., have written what I think is a very fine book on that subject. Uh, you guys, MIT Press 2012, call it uh, The Guardians of Finance. And I'm, uh, I've uh, been conducting a series of interviews here at the Glenn Show, and I think I may do one or two more on kind of where we are uh, in the area of banking regulation and finance. I expect this question, if Elizabeth Warren is going to be a candidate for president, is bound to come up again. And uh, God help us, should we uh, f fall into another crisis? But, I mean, I thought it would be useful to review the bidding 10 years out, you know, what happened in 2007 to 2009, uh, causes of this collapse, the consequences of this collapse in terms of the Great Recession and so forth, recovery from the collapse in terms of the policies put in place, uh, and uh, how are things looking forward? Can it happen again? Uh, and so on. I, I just wanted to get the benefit of your wisdom on, on that general set of questions. Sure. So... Let me start at the end. Um, yeah. I think it can happen again, and I think that the policies that have been implemented increase the probability that it will happen again and that it will be much larger. Um, so I know you had uh, you know, Larry Kotlikoff on the show, and he talked about a systemic failure. Yes. And although we disagree a lot about what that means, I think we both agree that the systemic um, failings of the system have not been corrected. Um, and, and I think that they're likely to lead to major problems in, in the future. Or put, put differently, the crisis wasn't big enough to really address the fundamental things that I believe were the primary causes of the crisis. Okay, let me just tell the uh, viewer, if they didn't see the um, conversation with Larry, that basically the systemic forces that he thinks are at work are that over-leveraged banks are susceptible to being run on, mm -hmm. and that that's just a deep problem, the only remedy for which is to not allow banks to be over-leveraged in the first place, and he has a scheme that he calls limited-purpose banking that accomplishes that in his view. What do you think the fundamentals were, and how so, is it that they haven't been remedied? Right, so just to, just to continue from that, yeah. um, I, I want to ask the question, why are the banks... So levered. What, what is it that created those over-levered banks, both the commercial banks and the over-levered um, um, investment banks? What caused them to be uh, unstable? And because that, I think, is what drove, what drove the crisis. And I think that what happened was we have a political system that created uh, financial policies and regulations that encouraged the executive as the executives at major financial institutions to take on excessive risk. At some point, these risks, you know, don't pay off, and that led to uh, bankruptcies and then the interventions by the by the government. So that's what I think drove the problem. Um, one could ask then the question: Okay, but why did this happen in two thousand and eight? And I think that what, what happened, the reason why this happened in 2008 is starting from about 10 years earlier, you had a variety of technological and financial innovations that made it easier for executives to take on excessive risk. And the political system did not allow um, regulations to evolve to address those new opportunities for taking risks. Um, I think we're, I think one of the big differences between my perspective on this and say Larry's and, and the, um, uh, 
the narratives that one would hear from Greenspan, Bernanke, Rubin, um, Geithner, Paulson, is that this built up over many years. This was not a multiple equilibrium in that all of a sudden people woke up and became um, uncomfortable with other people's perceptions of financial institutions and everybody went to take out their money. The risks built up in the banks, the risks built up in the commercial banks over a decade. And those institutions recognized that the risks were building up. They just didn't do anything about it. And so this is why I kind of fundamentally disagree with this perspective that you hear from, say, Paulson and that you hear from Bernanke or, or Greenspan or Geithner or Rubin, all the others who are heading the Treasury or the Fed, that this wasn't a flood. This wasn't a completely unpredictable, unforeseeable event. Little by little, these risks build up. The institutions were aware of them and chose not to do anything about it. And that's why I keep coming back to this issue that the political economy somehow didn't induce the regulators to adjust their policies as these risks grew. Okay, so now I'm assuming that the uh, environmental shift that you're talking about that made it easier to take these risks had to do with the um, advent of, of financial derivatives of one kind or another. Yep. And these complex instruments. Uh, can you explain how it is that that expanded the capacity of banks to take a risk and what political dynamics were ongoing that impeded regulators from uh, responding uh, to it effectively? Yes. So the let me give just one example. So. What banks have to do is banks, for example, take your deposits, take my deposits, and they raise a little bit of equity as well, but most of the money they gather comes from depositors, and then they make investments. They make loans, they make some other types of investments, they buy securities. The way that the system works is that to the extent that they take on riskier investments, <clears throat> regulators force them to raise a higher proportion of their money from equity. The reason why they want them to raise a higher proportion of their money from equity is that then if there's a problem in the assets, it's less likely to affect the depositors. So that's the way the system is set up. Because the system is set up like that, um, the bankers, they want to have as little amount of their money at risk as possible. And so the bankers want to have less of their money at risk, but they want to have access to the profits if the bank does well. And this is sort of the tension that exists between the bankers and the regulators. That's, that's, that's why bankers, that's why regulators go in and they look at capital. Capital is, is kind of a fancy way of saying how much do the bankers have to put on the line? They take on more risk, the regulators want them to put more money on money. And that's the way the system is supposed to work. Now, the bankers are quite clever, and they figured out a way to reduce how much money they put, uh, that they have to put at risk. And the way they did this was this, they said that, why don't we go, when we have these risky assets, why don't we go buy insurance on those risky assets from some other entity? This is credit default swaps. And so they would go to AIG, which was sort of the biggest seller of these things. They would buy insurance on their risky assets. Then they would have to go to the Fed. Then they would have to say, Fed, you make us hold more equity, put more of our money at risk. The risky are our are, are assets. But if we buy insurance on those risky assets, the risky assets are no longer risky. So you should not force us to put more of our money on the line. Well, hold on just a moment. The assets haven't gotten any less risky. The risk is only being shifted to the insurance company. And if the insurance company fails, the bank is in the same pot as if it had no insurance at all. Exactly. And so if you were the Fed, okay, and this is a debate that I had actually with the president of the uh, Boston Federal Reserve, and his response is, we, the Fed, were prohibited by law 
from supervising and regulating the entities selling insurance to the banks. So the Fed was not allowed to investigate AIG. And my response, which may be your response, which is, okay, maybe that's not the best system, but you have a very easy solution to this problem. And that is to say, we are not going to allow you to reduce how much of your money you have to have on the line by buying insurance unless we are 100% sure that the entity selling you that insurance are going to be solvent when bad things happen to your assets. But instead, you didn't do that. Instead, you allowed the banks to reduce the amount of, you allowed the bank owners to reduce the amount of money that they had at risk by billions and billions of dollars, even though you could not assess the riskiness of the entity selling insurance to the banks. That's what I mean. Now, this started in 1996. Okay, this was not a multiple equilibrium kind of an event. This grew steadily, 1996 up until 2008. Yeah. Not only that, I'm just giving, there are many examples. Let me just give one other element here. It's not that this went unnoticed, that there was a problem. Geithner, who was president of the New York Fed, said, boy, this is a problem. Because it's even a bigger problem than what I'm telling you. Because <clears throat> AIG, who sold the insurance, can sell their responsibility or buy to other entities. So the Fed does not even know who is insuring the bank. And they could not know. Because this is sold in a market. They, they looked into this. They studied this. They knew it was a problem. And they did nothing about it. This, was, so this is what I mean. This is, this is sort of what I mean. that We can go through lots of different examples of, of various financial players. Is that these things built up over time. There was information about them. People raised the alarm bells about it. And they chose to do nothing. Sorry. Okay. No, that's that's the uh, negligent homicide. Uh, that's where your negligent homicide metaphor comes in, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask a couple of questions. And first, I want to try to clarify something. And you correct me if I get this wrong for people who might be listening in who, who are not professional economists. You say it's not a multiple equilibrium phenomenon. Sorry. Yeah. And my friend and colleague, our colleague, Larry Kotlikoff, says it is. Larry's view is that uh, leveraged banks are susceptible to being run on. And the multiple equilibrium is that if nobody thinks the bank is going to be solvent tomorrow, everybody wants their money today. But if everybody tries to get their money precisely because of what you said, because of the fact that the banks don't have a 100 percent reserve requirement, they've got whatever it is, 25 percent or whatever number it is. And that means that the money is not in the bank. The money that the bank owes you has already been lent out to somebody else. The bank is counting on you not all coming at the same time. But if everybody thinks the bank is going to fail, they'll all want to go get their money and the bank will fail. That's an equilibrium. On the other hand, if people are confident that the bank is going to be stable through time, then they'll only go get their money when they need it. And as long as they all do that, the bank is going to be stable through time. So that's the multiple equilibrium phenomenon. Um, I, the, the question I want to ask is, OK, I have a financial institution that's leveraged the bank. Some of their skin is in the game, but a lot of it is not their skin. It's other people's skin that's in the game. It strikes me that there are two different things that can go wrong here. One is that they make bad loans. Mm -hmm. They loan out the money to entities that fail. The other is that they get run on. Mm -hmm. Those are, I think, different kinds of events and different kinds of risk. And I can see where a reserve requirement might help me with the running phenomenon, but I don't see how it helps me with the making bad loans phenomenon. Very good. Okay, fantastic. So, and this is, I think, the, I think this is, I think this is crucial, and I think that what we're the issue here um, is I think where the Fed is getting wrong, and most policy analysts get wrong um, can continue to get wrong. And that is that when you have this incentive to take on excessive risk, so for example, if I say, I'm going to give you my money to invest, 
Okay, and I'm going to pay you a salary for investing my money. Okay. Now, if you just invest my money wisely, you get my salary. If you make a really big return on my money, I'm going to give you an enormous bonus. Okay, if you lose all of my money, you still get your salary. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a bad deal to me. Heads I win, tails I win, or at least exactly. I don't win. <laughs> And so, you know, in the jargon of economics, I've just sort of described moral hazard situation. You know, without all of the bells and whistles and the nomenclature, what I've described is a situation in which you clearly have incentives to increase risk. You want to increase risk even if it doesn't increase expected returns because you want to increase the chance that there's this big, big payoff, even if it doesn't change the average return because you can become enormously wealthy. And I mean enormously wealthy if you hit it big. That's the incentives that the executives had in all of the major financial institutions. Okay, why is this important for the reasons that you're sort of saying is that what this means is that they are going to allocate resources poorly. Excessive risk here doesn't just mean, oh, you need to take some risk to get returns. Here, excessive risk means you want to increase risk even if it doesn't increase expected returns. But I, I move to ask, uh, where is the board of directors of this financial institution that presumably is setting the compensation contract for these managers? And why would, I mean, you can write that contract in many different ways. And uh, the way you described is only one of them. Why would they agree to incentivize uh, counterproductive risk taking in their managerial ranks? So here, yes. And so here what we have is a problem of corporate governance, which has been extremely well documented, not just in financial institutions, but in other types of large corporations in the U.S. We are the board of governors, the, the board of directors, I'm sorry, um, does not effectively govern and manage the executives. Indeed, it is oftentimes the executives that choose the board of directors of the corporations um, themselves. You have that, and you also have the issue that if I'm a small shareholder, I also want the financial institution to take on large risks. So I am going to choose executives that are going to take on a lot of risk because if this institution fails i'm pretty sure the government is not just going to, is going to is the government is going to come in bail out the financial institution and i as a shareholder am not going to face the full consequences of those risks for example goldman sachs almost certainly would have failed without the intervention by the government. That means the equity holders would have been wiped out or at least would have lost a lot. And they didn't lose anything. The executive, Lloyd Blankenfeld, who had been the executive that had led Goldman Sachs into the crisis, did lose a bonus for a year and then continued on as the executive until very recently. So these gambles turned out, not everywhere and always, but almost everywhere and always, to be very, very much within the personal interests of the people making those decisions. Now, for society as a whole, this is what I wanted to get at that, that you raise, is that the huge issue is not the cost of the government bailing out the financial institution. That's what everybody is focused on. The big issue is that for a decade, society's savings were funneled to the wrong things. They were funneled to excessively risky ventures. They were funneled to real estate. And what that meant is that young men and young women who were making career choices followed where their salaries were looked the brightest even though those were the wrong investments for society as a whole, 
And those were the wrong investments for those individuals over the long run. But it was impossible for them to see through all of that. So the problem with the financial regulations that encourage these successive risk is not the bailout of the financial institutions narrowly defined. It's the fact that society's savings that's funneled through these things goes to the wrong endeavors. And that, I think, helps explain why the recession was so long after 2008. Because for a long time, society had sent the money to the wrong places. And it takes a long time for people to adjust. Now, this is, uh, I'm uh, embarrassed, I have to say, the first time I'm hearing this argument, uh, the argument being that the cost of the financial crisis and the ensuing recession, or the link, I should say, between the financial crisis and the ensuing, was not so much a credit crunch where companies wanting to employ people and build projects couldn't get the loans that they needed to finance the enterprises. And so there was this kind of uh, uh, spiral downward in terms of aggregate demand and so forth. Not that. But rather, which it's an episodic thing. That's a thing that comes on when the system seizes up. Rather, you're arguing, as if I understand you, that uh, the link between financial activity and the real economy and the severity of the recession has to do with uh, years and years of the misallocation of resources to less productive enterprises, which, <laughs> when the financial crunch did hit the fan, yep. really, really cost, cost us uh, a lot more than it needed to. The recession could have been less deep. And shorter, <laughs> yep. if I'm reading you right, if we had not been misallocating uh, uh, savings to a activities which were not uh, enhancing real uh, output. Definitely. I mean, it's the, wow. so this is, this is sort of what I've been, I mean, so what I've spent most of my professional clear looking at is, is finance, but the links between finance and the rest of the economy. I don't care particularly about the financial institutions. What I care about is how they affect people. And what I'm concerned about are the people that may or may not ever really learn much or do much with finance. Let's say you have a worker and he or she go to their, to their jobs. How does finance affect them? It affects the types of jobs that they can look for. It affects whether the economy is dynamic and they have options in terms of the jobs that they can go to. Um, and they, it affects how volatile the whole market is. And that's, that's where I think the real costs are. And you, you get that from focusing across countries, which is something that I've done, and looking at a variety of different circumstances. And so to me, what has happened in the U.S. has been a deterioration in the financial regulatory system, which means that money goes to the wrong places. And this will have long-run consequences. Is the U.S. Uh, noticeably different, worse in this respect, let's say, than the European Union? Um, so, yeah. yeah. So this brings up something. Um, this brings up something quite interesting, and, and 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 it goes back to an earlier question you asked, which is about what is it about the political philosophy that sort of led to these types of regulations? So I, I want to, if, if it's okay, I want to go back to that and then come back to to Europe. Okay. So. So I think that there's a, um, I, I think that like Greenspan, I, I think he was, doesn't understand free markets. I think, <laughs> I, 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 I think he really is, I think he was right when he went in front of Congress and said there's a flaw in his system, that there was always a flaw in his system. And, and the, the flaw is as follows, is that if you have free markets, um, and there's no government intervention except that contracts somehow were perfectly enforced and all of that. One can come up with an argument, an Ayn Rand type of an argument, that markets will be self-correcting, meaning that if things deviate, the you know, competition will sort of fix things. Fair enough. You know, in that nice theoretical world, that's just fine. And I, however, there is no theory that I'm aware of. You're a theorist, so you can correct me which suggests that if the government comes into that environment, creates a regulatory regime that encourages excessive risk-taking and rewards excessive risk-taking, the free market is not going to correct the incentives 
imposed by this regulatory regime. So Greenspan's notion that a free market was going to fix a problem created by the regulatory environment makes no sense. It simply makes no sense. And, and so, and then now I'll come back to Europe and, and, and the US. Okay. The US is a bit schizophrenic because on the one hand, both before the crisis and to a much greater degree after the crisis, there is a explicit and even more so an implicit promise that the government will bail out an institution. The crisis hit, the government bailed out everything. It bailed out commercial banks, it bailed out investment banks. If we were having this discussion 20 years ago, the notion that the government would bail out investment banks, never, but it did. It bailed out the investment banks, it bailed out money market mutual funds, it bailed out the commercial paper market. Okay, so this is like, you know, huge entities lending money to other huge entities. Okay, so it bailed out, every, it bailed out an insurance company. Okay, it's like, it's hard to figure out, like, what didn't it bail out? General Motors, I guess. So the one thing that the government showed is that it will bail out everything. Now, what does this mean? This means is if I'm an investor in a financial institution of any size, I'm pretty confident that the government is going to bail me out. If that's the case, I want to invest, and I want that entity to take on a lot of risk so I can enjoy that potential upside. Okay, so what's the other side of this argument? If the bailouts weren't going to happen, then there must be people who were worried about dominoes tipping over and stuff like sure, that. Sure, and I, we can we can talk about that. But I, I want to I want to first talk about I want to first talk about Europe and like this. Okay, I, I beg your pardon. Go ahead. Okay, if that's the situation, and that is the situation, then the executives in these financial institutions have incentives to take on a lot of risk. The market is not going to self-correct that. So you need in that circumstance an intervention by the government to address those incentives for excessive risk taking. Then we can argue about what's the correct intervention, but you have to intervene somehow. The market is not going to self-correct. Now, in Europe, they looked at this situation and they said, okay, we're going to heavily regulate the financial system and prevent it from taking on excessive risk. That has all sorts of bad ramifications because then the government is strangling the financial system. Not everything the financial system does is you know, bad and that might curtail risk and innovation. The US, is schizophrenic in the sense that after the crisis, it imposes lots of controls on the financial system, sort of like European. But this is very, very uncomfortable for the US ethos, free market capitalism. So now the US has a choice. And it has two reasonable choices and one terrible choice. One reasonable choice is that you continue to strangle the financial system. Sort of you have the too big to fail, you have the excessive risk, and then you need to contain the excessive risk, you have regulation. That's one option. Another option is that you basically get rid of the regulations on what the banks can do, and at the same time, force the people who are making the decisions to have more of their personal wealth at risk so that they no longer have incentives to take on excessive risk. So one is that you really make a movement toward more of a free market by getting rid of the constraints and by changing the incentives. Also reasonable, probably my first choice. The third option is the bad option, and it's the option that I believe the US will pursue. And that is in the name of free markets, and you can see this going on in the treasury now little by little, is that 
let's get rid of the government controls on regulation and allow the market to work. This can't work if you don't get rid of the incentives for excessive risk taking. What would that mean practically? What does it mean? What does it mean practically yeah, is that? You, yeah, go ahead. So, which one? Sorry, I'm better. Which one? What we, well, well, you say you can either be uh, regulating or maybe even over regulating and strangulating because you're restricting what the uh, financial institutions can do with their funds in the interest of preventing them from taking on too much risk, or you can force the people who are making these decisions to have more of their own personal wealth skin in the game and have different incentives about taking on the risk. Yep. And so I'm asking as a practical matter, uh, what would that ladder look, look like? Fine. So, so I, I, I was at the, uh, this kind of gets me into trouble. So I, I, get, I get invited and then I say something like this and then I, I don't get invited again for a while, but I was at the Jackson Hole Conference um, this uh, this past August. The Jackson Hole Conference is a collection of the world's central bankers and bank regulators and, and treasury and people from private banks. They all come to Jackson Hole, Wyoming and, and talk about the world. And they typically have a few academics come and give talks and, and then they can talk about the other things, the important things that they want to talk about. But the, the question that I raised with them um, is... If, a finance, if, a, if we look at all financial, major financial institutions in the world, and we just take one and, and, and kind of, and it fails, um, would the executives in this financial institution lose a lot of their personal wealth? Um, for, would they lose their house? Would anything really substantially bad happen to them? And I would argue that essentially the answer to that is no, for all major banks in the United States, and for basically all major banks in Europe, and for almost everywhere in the world. And I asked, I said, if, if, if anybody disagrees, you don't just, the news is like all the work of all the bankers in the world are there, you don't come and tell me. And you know, nobody comes, nobody challenges that. That the people who make the decisions really won't lose very much if these institutions fail. This is a problem. Because they just have incentives to take excess, you know, enormous risks. And you had this guy, I can't remember his name. You had the CEO recently, John Stumpf of, of Wells Fargo, who sort of was in charge of the bank and they did all sorts of, you know, bad practices. And he had to pay a fine of $40 million, which sounds like an enormous amount. Man, over the course of his career, he made hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, not that big of a deal, 40 for him. Did he make the right personal choices? You know, yes, he did. So what could it entail? It can entail many things. So there are, it can entail that some of their bonuses and salaries are put in escrow and it can only be paid out slowly over time as long as the financial institution, um, you know, continues to be successful. So that can be one type of a solution. Um, you could have oversight over what type of compensation could actually be given. Maybe you restrict you know, how much you get if the firm does well, and you make it the case that the, the, the executive would actually have to lose part of his or her salary if the institution does poorly. Um, so I, I don't want to be too specific because – the the goal is clear that this person has to feel personal financial loss if the institution doesn't do well. Um, and, and that has to be severe enough so that this person acts in a prudent way. The exact design of that can be different in different countries. Um, and you're going to need lawyers to make sure that all of that kind of works fine. So, so you take, you know, Bear Stearns goes under during the crisis. Yeah. Uh, I gather that executives at Bear Stearns, I would name them if I could recall their names, yeah. Jimmy Kane, somebody like that, uh, were uh, heavily invested in the company that they own shares. The shares went from whatever they were, uh, 80 bucks a share to two bucks a share overnight. I make the number up, but you know what I'm talking <laughs> about, something like that. You're going to tell me they didn't suffer a loss? I think that I think one has to look at it at, 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 
as their sort of their lifetime decision making. So if we start at the, at the beginning when they took over these things and you ask and you say to them, look, you're going to have a 10 year run and you're going to get you know, a series of $40 million bonuses and you're going to keep accumulating stock options. And then, you know, if this thing happens to fail, then you're going to lose those stock, op stock options and you're going to get those bonuses as long as the profits keep soaring. That's going to give incentives for people to take on really big risks. And the owners, remember, the people who are voting for the board of directors might exert some influence. They want that risk. The owners want the risk because they want those big profits as well. And they're counting on getting bailed out on the downside. Right. And so they're going to choose somebody that gives them what they want. You said so. Yeah. Now, if I were running a steel company or, you know, uh, I'm a farmer with a huge enterprise and I have to make decisions, I make bad decisions. Yeah. You're, going to, you're going to come from my house. Or is it only bankers who, who end up <laughs> getting bankrupted in the event that they, uh, that they make poor business decisions? So everything here stems from this too big to fail issue. That if investors in an institution, I'm going to use institution because it could be a steel, a steel firm or, or a bank, before I buy a bond um, in a steel company, I want to make sure that 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 instant that firm is being run well i want to make sure that the executives are not taking excessive risks i want to make sure that there's a lot of equity in the bank i'm going to make sure that the bank the sorry the steel firm is not very levered why because if the small steel firm fails the government is not going to bail it out there the market works bondholders and equity holders are going to battle this out and, and you're not going to get very levered steel companies. Okay. In the U.S., before this notion that the government would bail out banks came to be, banks were not more levered than steel companies. People were not stupid. It's like, well, I'm not going to lend money, put my money in this bank, unless I know the owner has a lot of his or her money in the bank. Yeah. And that's what existed. The now, for example, it's about it's it's probably about one dollar of equity for you know twenty dollars of debt in a bank. Okay, it's probably a ratio of one to twenty. Okay, and if you go back uh, before this too big to fail, before deposit insurance and other types of things, it was about 50-50. And that's more to your liking? More than to my liking, it's, it's what the market demands when there's, there are not policies that facilitate excessive risk-taking and higher leverage. Okay, now forgive me my naivete here. I'm worried about something like uh, not enough liquidity. If I can't, so the lower the reserve requirement, the more a given amount of invested money can get multiplied through the system into, into uh, uh, you know, the money multiplier dynamic. Uh, so is that, is that something that one should not be worried about? If I have 50% instead of 5% uh, of uh, equity, uh, that I have uh, less liquidity in the system? No, I don't think you have to worry about that. If we need more money, the Fed can create more money. Not, not a problem. So I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that that's... Here, here I, know, I know Larry answered this also on your... He did, uh, yeah. Okay, no, I, so I, I, this, is, this is one of the few things I agreed with him on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you would not have bailed out the investment banks? You would have let them go under? So, very good. So... I think what I would have done is something much closer to what was done with General Motors. And that is, given that the crisis hit, you can bail out the banks and not bail out the bankers. The issue was to fire the executives to make the decision makers in the banks lose as much as possible and to bring in new executives. 
And that way, those new executives would know that if they behaved in an imprudent manner, that they would suffer. But that it would be a, at that point, so for just talking 2008, at that point, allowing all of these financial institutions to fail, I think would have been catastrophic. So I think that if you say, okay. did Bernanke, yeah. I think saving the, the banks was a good idea. I think saving the bankers was a bad idea. You want to change incentives. Again, I can see an ideological problem for the and Rand contingent uh, because you're kind of quasi-nationalizing the banks now, aren't you? I mean, the price that you're paying for coming up with the uh, uh, rescue is control over the management of the of the enterprise. Yes, until you have, and you have to re, you have to privatize it again. Yes, that's true. The now, but it's not that it, it all depends upon where you start the story. So remember, the story starts from the government having a whole assortment of regulations in place and supervisory practices in place that create expectations that the government will bail out the financial institutions. You already have massive government involvement in the financial system. And they created incentives for excessive risk taking. Now, given that there's a failure, what the, given that like it's 2008 and the world is ending, what do you do? You must fail out the financial institutions. And at the same time, if you can, you must um, make it as painful as possible for the executives that led into the crisis. Okay, I want to ask you why you think that didn't happen. I know politics is going to be the answer, but I want the details. But but um, first, I want to ask you whether or not you have a problem with deposit insurance. I, I thought the whole point was to prevent bank runs. That's what I thought a deposit insurance was for, to stabilize the system. Yeah, no, I don't. I, I Look, the problem... <laughs> The problem was not deposit insurance. If you're thinking about deposit insurance of, you know, the, the people with $100,000 in a bank, yes. this, this is not what created the problem, even increasing yeah. it to $250,000. Re remember that AIG, a gigantic financial institution, I think at the time was the largest insurance company in the world, was writing a credit default swap to Goldman Sachs, an enormous, complicated global financial institution, and the government came in and insured that security. <laughs> That's not deposit insurance. Got it. <laughs> no, it's a long way from deposit insurance. So why did the bailout take the form of bailing out the bankers as well as the banks? Uh, what so was going think, on there? I think that there's two things. Um, one I think is easy to understand, and the other um, I'm not sure I fully understand, um, but, but I'm sure. So the, the two is, the, the, the one is simply politics, that, the, that there is a very tight-knit group of people that compose the leaders of the major banks, the leaders of the major regulatory institutions, and you know, positions in the major central banks around the world. When you go to these conferences at, ja at, at Jackson Hole, or if you go to Basel, or if you go to, to Italy, and I had the great fortune to go and, and give some talks and hang out, the people who were bankers one year are the regulators this year and vice versa. And that's the way it is. Um, every single head of the New York Federal Reserve, when he, and they've all been he's, has left public office, have gone to work for a major financial institution. Okay, almost all in the city of New York. When you look at Geithner and you look at um, Bernanke, they're all working for private financial institutions now at massive amounts of, for massive amounts of money. Uh, when you looked at, you know, who was the head of the, the treasury that deregulated, it was Rubin, um, who had been at Goldman Sachs. And then after deregulation, 
um, allowed uh, the commercial banks to do more interesting finance. He then went to um, Citibank and earned another $100 million from them before leaving in the end of 2008, saying that the crisis was this 100 years flood that you know happened to them. Nothing could be done. So there's the connections there just are they I was at I was at a banking conference and I was sitting around with the with the heads of um, the compliance departments, the vice presidents of three of the major banks in the U.S., along with the head of inspection of financial institutions at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Every single one of those compliance officers had been the head of, <laughs> of, of compliance at the SEC, and the guy who is now regulating the banks at the SIC had been had been at one of these private banks. So I think that that's part of it. I think another part of it is that there is a legal element in that things happen quickly in a financial crisis, and so the it's legally going into a fi an institution that has not been declared bankrupt yet and taking it away from its owners is a degree of nationalization that we really don't want to allow. And so intervening by funneling money into those financial institutions is possible. Taking it away and firing executives is a very different legal step. And something that can happen now or during calmer times would be a figuring out ways to address it. And I think that there are steps that they are trying to do. You can just, there are questions about how effective. Now, you said at the start of this conversation that you thought the situation today might even be worse than it was in 2007. And you think that the actions that have been taken, and I'm thinking in particular of the Dodd-Frank financial regulation legislation, have been inadequate. Could you just say a little bit more about that? How are things worse or as bad or worse than they were before? And why is it that what the Congress has tried to do in the interim, in your view, has uh, not been effective? Okay, so the reason, why, the reason why I think that it's worse kind of goes back to what I think caused the problem in, in the first place. So I think it's, it's about the policies and regulations that create incentives for excessive risk taking. I'm, I'm an economist, so almost everything always focuses on incentives. Um, now, if you it, so, if you think what happened with the crisis, so one thing became clear with the crisis: whether you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're going to bail out everything. So this means the expectations on the part of investors has broadened. For an economist, the moral hazard problem is intensified. The incentives and the ability to take on risk has grown. But it, it's not just because of the bailout. Part of what Dodd-Frank does is it says that the Fed, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, is going to be responsible for the supervision of all systemically important institutions. So that's pretty broad all systemically important institutions. So that's like broad, undefined. The Fed has been unwilling to define it. And so if I'm an investor, it's like, okay, basically anything that's big, the Fed is supposed to be supervising it to make sure it's not going to be very, too risky. Therefore, I don't really have to do much work to assess that it's too risky or not. Because this is the responsibility of the Fed. Why is it the responsibility of Fed? There's this act of Congress saying that it's the responsibility of the Fed. And the Fed says that it's carrying out the act of, con of Congress. So this puts a, a really broad official statement about uh, the Fed's responsibility to make sure that all systemically important institutions, not even financial institutions, there can be any institution, it's under their purview. So to me, this means that investors are less inclined to constrain risk because they figure the Fed is doing that. And this is going to intensify incentives for risk taking. I see very little in the way. And here, Jay Powell, the chair of the Fed, I think would disagree here. There's, there's room for disagreement. I think that there's been very little done 
to make the executives have more skin in the game so that they lose their house or they lose something if the financial institution fails. Here, there's some disagreement. I think that there's, on the books, I think there are some efforts in order to make them more liable for their actions. None of it has been tried. Most recently, when the banks failed some of their stress tests and they weren't supposed to distribute dividends, the Fed sort of let them go and allowed them to distribute dividends. It's not clear whether this is actually going to work in practice and whether um, investors in financial institutions believe that the executives really do have um, much to lose. And I think over time, as I mentioned, and what we're seeing is that the restrictions on what banks can do, this is going to dissipate through lobbying. And the political climate, um, it, it, at least in the last three years and perhaps going forward, is going to, I think is going to slowly um, reduce the restrictions on what financial institutions can do. And that, that's what makes me worry. And this has to do with money? With uh, the financial industry being a source of campaign support for politicians? Yep. I mean, I'm just asking. Oh, yeah. I mean, you've talked about this revolving door, which blows my mind. Hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation to somebody? I mean, I'm, I am wondering, and I know it's going to sound incredibly naive, what could an individual be bringing to the table by way of human capital that would warrant a compensation at that level? So if I'm a regulator and I'm looking down the road, I'm thinking I don't want to alienate my friends too much because there's a big payday coming for me, and therefore I'm implicitly captive to the system and, and I'm compliant. Um, but I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking more than one question at the same time. I'd be interested to know what you do to get a hundred million dollars out of financial services firm if, if, by way of compensation. What the hell are you doing to earn that money? So, so I, I would switch it around. So I would say, how much would you be willing to pay the executives of financial institutions to actually allocate society's savings safely and soundly and prudently without taking excessive risk. And about, I think, about as much as I'd pay an NBA superstar or something like that, you know. I, I think you'd be willing to pay them, given how important that is, if you think about the allocation of capital, the allocation of economic opportunities, that's all coming from the financial system. If they're doing their job well, this has profound implications for the prosperity of the economy overall. And if they're doing their job poorly, it, also, it has implications that way. So I think that the, I don't think that the, I, I don't have an answer to the question, what's the right amount to compensate them? But I think that the, the problem is, is that society is paying them a lot of money or has in the past paid them an enormous amount of money to allocate society's resources poorly. I'd be willing to double their payment if they actually did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I, I don't know, the way we're talking past each other, you're telling me what it would be worth for them to do a good job. And I'm, I don't know the answer to I'm you. wondering how the market works that they, you know, I was brought up on marginal productivity theory of wages, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure it's this out. It's distorted. They don't get paid. They don't get paid the social marginal product they're, they're not. They get paid the they get paid a, 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 the private return that's based on an entire regulatory supervisory apparatus that distorts their returns. Is there anybody out there in the political universe who you think has got this kind of right? Is a Cory Booker or an Elizabeth Warren or uh, uh, anybody uh, talking the kind of talk that you think makes sense in this context? I think it's, I think that it's, what I found is um, it's extreme, it, it, this, it's extremely difficult to explain this in a short soundbite. It's easy. It's easy to get angry at sort of the executives making so much money. Um, and so then you want to say, you know, let's limit how much money they make. Yeah. Um, and it's easy to say, it's like, oh, the, Banks are too levered. So, okay, let's make them not levered. But that won't address the issue. The, the issue is, why are they doing what they're doing? Somehow one has to address the incentives of the decision makers in these financial institutions. And that's, 
I don't hear anybody talking about those things. Early on in Elizabeth Warren's career, um, I was in, in the Senate, not in her career, in the Senate, I was really optimistic because I'd never seen somebody so insightful in her questions of the, the supervisors and regulators and bankers. I had never seen somebody who really, really knew what she was talking about yeah. the way she did, a, a politician, you know, there were the other, yeah. uh, other people. Um, she worked on bankruptcy law, didn't she, as a scholar? Yeah, no, she, she was, I, I thought her, she was just extraordinary. I think, I think her views have, have gone a little, they've gone in a different direction. Um, and I, I think she's talking about the whole system being rigged and, and, and um, I'm, I'm not sure she's focusing on what I see as this core issue, which is the incentives. The others, I don't, I don't see it at all. We need less demagoguery and more smart financial economic analysis of the sort that you bring to the table, Ross. Well, there's a lot of other people, but it's uh, it's so hard to um, it's so ha- it's so hard to have good conversations about this now. It seems harder than it did than it did ten years ago, twenty years ago to me, but I. I don't know. I could be wrong about that. Well, we we uh, we gave it a shot here uh, this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> I thought it was a good. Hey, Glenn, it's just great talk. It's just great talking to you. Thank you, oh, and uh, good to talk to you too, Ross. I think we'll sign off for the, for now, and we'll talk again sometime soon. Fantastic. So, thanks again for coming on the Glenn Show. My pleasure. Be good.